A vulture fund is what it sounds like, a fund that buys struggling debts such as a mortgage. What Catriona Carey would do is tell prospective clients that her firm would buy the distressed mortgage that they could never pay off. The client could keep their house. Carrie would charge them interest for a long-term profit. But as you can guess, this isn't what happened. Catriona Carey was born in County Kilkenny, Ireland in 1977 or 78. Oddly, Carey's records aren't clear on her birth year. However, nobody's arguing her impact on women's sports in Ireland. Young Carey started playing stick and ball games like field hockey and camogie at a young age. Her older brother, DJ Carey, was an active athlete and went on to have a successful pro career of his own. Carrie grew up playing with DJ, leading to a love of sports and competition. Carrie made her career in 1998 when she signed onto the Ireland national field hockey team. She played in 72 matches over seven years. Before she retired from the sport, Carrie led her country to the 2005 Euro Hockey Nations Championship in Dublin. However, before her highly touted field hockey career, Carrie played a sport called camogie. In Ireland, camogie is a popular stick and ball game played exclusively by women. The sport is quite similar to field hockey, so her skills transitioned well on the camogie field. She started playing professionally in 1992 when she joined the Clara GAA Club, GAA standing for Gaelic Athletic Association. Camogie and hurling are sports invented in Ireland hundreds of years ago. So Kerry wasn't just excelling at a popular sport, she participated in her country's cultural tradition. Both Kerry and her brother DJ made names for themselves through these traditional sports. And after 14 years in Irish professional sports, Kerry decided it was time to hang up the stick and helmet. Kerry played sports almost all her adult life. Now, she was in her early 30s and needed a career change. Fortunately, Carrie studied accounting in school, so DJ gave her a job at his cleaning company. He put her in charge of his company's finances because of her training and familial ties. He'd regret that decision two years later. Carrie was charged with her first criminal offense in 2008, only two years after retiring from professional sports and working for her brother. Carrie was forced to resign from DJ's company and pay a fine to the Revenue Commissioners, an Irish government agency that collects taxes and enforces the National Tax Code. Basically, they're the Irish IRS. They investigated Carrie after she used her accounting skills to send them a falsified invoice from DJ's company. Their investigators traced the invoice back to Carrie, who took the fall for the whole scheme. The revenue commissioners fined Carrie $1,622 for trying to trick them. However, the ensuing court hearing revealed Carrie's other financial crimes against the revenue commissioner. Carrie also falsified another invoice that claimed the company was entitled to a tax return according to the evidence they compiled. When the return arrived in the mail, Carrie pocketed the money for herself. The fine, of course, helped the revenue commissioners get some of their money back. The court hearing ended and Carrie left the building in disgrace. She submitted her resignation to DJ less than six months after the hearing and went to work on her own. Once again, Carrie's future was uncertain. All she had was her training as an accountant and her experience in sports. Legally, she'd have a hard time using one of those skills. Carrie could have gone into coaching or come out of retirement for a few years. She hinted at playing again in 2008, but never signed any contracts. Instead, Carrie decided to continue her accounting career. But since no accounting firm or company would hire her, Carrie had to get creative. So she founded Carrie's for Asset Estates, a financial firm that marketed itself as a vulture fund, but never actually bought any dying debts. As we said at the beginning, a vulture fund is what it sounds like, a fund that buys struggling debts like mortgages. Remember when we said she would tell clients that they could keep their house and Carrie would just charge them interest? An Irish chef named Sharon O'Reardon was one such client. Sharon worked for a hospital in Castletown, Ireland, cooking in their massive kitchens. But despite the steady work, Sharon admits that she got behind on her mortgage. Soon, she found herself in deep water with her lender. She was about to lose her home. Sharon spent many days in court fighting with her lender over the repossession. That's where she met a barrister who offered Sharon a solution to all her problems. The barrister mentioned a woman named Catriona Carey. They explained that Carey is an accountant offering a financial product to those in need, a bailout that benefits both parties. It almost sounded too good to be true, but Sharon was desperate and the deal made sense. Vulture funds are pretty standard. Why couldn't one be helpful? Sharon contacted Carrie and set up a meeting. Carrie impressed Sharon when they met for the first time. She later told journalists for RTE, an Irish investigative media company, that Carrie's handshake impressed her the most. It was a firm handshake. To Sharon, people who use a firm handshake are straightforward people that don't beat around the bush. In hindsight, Sharon views Carrie as the exception. 
But at the time, Sharon found Carrie personable and likable. Carrie was also flexible during their negotiations. She initially asked for a $27,000 deposit from Sharon. Unfortunately, the hospital chef didn't have $27K. So Carrie said she'd settle for $5,400. Sharon assumed Carrie was accepting a lower deposit because she wanted to help her out. However, Sharon didn't have 5K either. She had asked her family to let her borrow the money. They gave her the much needed funds, assuming that Carrie's offer would save Sharon from financial ruin. In December of 2020, Sharon collected their money and handed every dollar over to Carrie at the nearby hotel called the Midlands. After receiving the firm handshake, Sharon says she felt like the happiest person on earth as she drove home from the hotel. Carrie promised to pay her back 30 days later. Carrie's firm would buy her mortgage and not long after, giving Sharon a new start in life. Sharon said it was like a Christmas miracle. The deal felt like a miracle when Sharon received an email in December 2020 from Carrie's Fort telling her they have officially bought the old mortgage and were preparing new contracts set for signing by the end of January. Sharon didn't know it at the time, but she wasn't the only person to receive an email like this. There were several other Carrie's Fort clients all across Ireland who expected new contracts. The email even specified that they'd finished structuring the written agreement by the end of January. Miriam and Philip Tormey, an Irish couple, read the same message from Carrie's Fort. They had struck a similar deal with Carrie, receiving the same kindness, understanding, flexibility, and firm handshake. Philip lost his job after the company he worked for collapsed. Philip and Miriam's finances, in turn, fell apart. They soon found themselves in the same court Sharon frequented. They happened to run to the same barrister, who gave them the same tip. Go see Catriona Carey. She'll solve all your problems. The only difference between Miriam and Philip was that they could afford to pay the full deposit. Miriam's name wasn't on their mortgage paper, so she obtained a $21,000 loan from their credit union. Neither of them had ever received a loan this size and under such drastic circumstances. Nevertheless, as Miriam says, she trusted Philip, and Philip seemed to trust Carrie. They all said they trusted Carrie. All 18 victims. After the first emails in December, Sharon, Philip, Miriam, and 16 others didn't hear from Carrie's Fort until after January 31st, the proposed deadline. Carrie's Fort emailed their client several times over the next few months with excuses and expected delays, but always promised that the contracts would be ready soon. Miriam recalls getting emails with the most tragic stories inside. She didn't know it at the time, but Carrie, the formerly respected pro athlete, was telling her clients flat out lies. She told her clients that the contracts were late one week because an employee had a brain hemorrhage. Then another employee got injured in a devastating car crash. Each excuse was more tragic than the previous one. Some clients became frustrated, others became skeptical. And only one client fully realized what was going on, though he found out by sheer luck. His name is Colin Finnegan. Colin gave Carrie $16,000 in deposit money after his parents' shop went under in 2019. He bought the property for his parents back in 2006, and they turned the building into a post office shop living space. However, when Colin's haulage business crumbled, he couldn't afford to pay the mortgage anymore. He needed help. That's when, like so many other desperate people, he found Carrie. She offered him the same deal she gave to the others, and Colin accepted it. He waited for his contract, never saw the papers. Only tragic excuses from Carrie's for it. Colin and his parents waited 18 months until something finally happened, though it wasn't what they were expecting. Colin was at his parents' shop one day when a man walked in saying he was interested in their property after seeing it on BIDX1, a website that hosts online auctions for properties that have defaulted on their loans. But that was impossible. Carrie bought their loan. All they needed to do was sign a new contract with her. Colin, confused, contacted Carrie who explained that they'd put the property up for auction a while back and someone bought it, though Carrie insisted her firm made the purchase. However, the new owners contacted Colin and said that his parents could remain on the property but would have to pay rent. Colin knew Carrie scammed him. He decided to let it go until he received an unexpected message from Carrie. The firm accidentally sent out the contact info for all their clients in a group message. Colin and the 17 other victims now had each other's contact information. He, along with Sharon, Philip, and Miriam, joined a WhatsApp group created by another victim, Andrew Hickey. The 18 victims shared their unique but very similar stories about meeting Carrie and acquiring her services. Eventually, their mutual Mutual experiences turned into an investigation into Carrie's Ford Asset Estates. RTE got their information from the 18 victims and shared it with local authorities. The police, in turn, arrested Carrie for fraud. The group chat was ecstatic, but in later interviews, they revealed the long term effects of Carrie's scam. Miriam told RTE that her depression only got worse since Carrie entered her life. Like so many others, Miriam and Philip still had their mortgage to pay, plus the $26,000 Carrie stole from them. Others paid even loftier deposits. One couple handed Carrie nearly $38,000. The victims assumed that Carrie would be in jail by now for her crimes. Some estimates put her mortgage scam in the mid-six figures 
But taking Carrie down is much more complicated than anyone anticipated. Some theorize that Carrie is receiving help from an associate of hers, Charles Allen, the Rodolphus Allen family trust manager. The trust has been under scrutiny over the past few years, with critics accusing Allen of exploiting people with distressed mortgages. Carrie's name was attached to that same fund in 2013. Their association came up again in March of 2022. An associate of Charles was photographed picking up Carrie from a mysterious home she was staying at leading many to theorize that Charles is financially supporting Carrie. If that's the case, Carrie now has an alleged billionaire in her corner, and we all know how often they get convicted. Thanks to Charles, Carrie has been attending field hockey club activities like practices, scrimmages, and matches as she awaits her fate in an Irish court, which isn't looking good. Investigators are still getting complaints against Carrie and her firm. As of April 2022, there are over 30 such complaints filed by the local police. That's a number even Charles Allen might have trouble beating. Click here to watch one of these next videos, and let us know in the comments section whether or not you think that the barrister at the court was in on the scam.